Hello, this is David Bernstein, founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values, and this is the SpeechCast, a joint venture with the Speech Project of the Jewish Journal. I'm uh, delighted to have with us today Peter Savodnik. Uh, Peter is a writer, a journalist. He writes for such publications as Vanity Fair, Harper's, The Atlantic, Tablet, um, New York Times Magazine, and so forth. Uh, he's an author. He wrote a book on Lee Harvey Oswald in 2013. He also he lives in L.A. Uh, someone that I've followed closely, especially in the last several months, as sort of the culture wars have flared up. And he had a piece in, um, in Barry Weiss's Substack that caught my eye as well. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed reading you, Peter, and I'm um, delighted to be able to talk today. Great to be here. So, uh, so Peter, I, I know you have some observations about the current ideological moment. How would you characterize them? I, look, we're in a very fraught uh, place. Um, and I, I think that uh, especially for American Jews, this is a, a, a very strange time um, because I think, I think there was this expectation for a long time that we had transcended uh, not only the the old world, which was the promise of, of America, of the new world, but also any of America's residual uh, hatreds or or um, myopias, and and in and in fact, uh, what 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 we're learning is that uh, anti-Semitism is the inextinguishable hate, and uh, and it has resurfaced and metastasized in a way that I think nobody even three or four years ago could have anticipated. You've written um, more than just about the anti-Semitic dimensions, which I would love to go into, but also about sort of the free expression dimensions of this challenge. You're a writer, you're right. a journalist. Um, that's got to be impacted in this environment. Explain how that how that's been for you. I mean, for me, I, I, I've you know I've been busy. I've got a lot to write about, but I think that the the climate, the the the, the world that we find ourselves in right now is um, much more constrained and much more, um, uh, much more in a way electric, not, not in a good way, in the sense that, that um, there's a sensitivity and, a, and I think a, um, a, a sort of low level and, and sometimes more than low level danger that seems to kind of um, um, pervade the sort of the, the sort of the social media channels and and sort of the kind of collective consciousness, if you will. What I mean by that is um, there's a, there's a, a great deal of sensitivity now. There's a great deal of of fretting and worrying and 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 I think very you know, rational uh, worrying about. Um, how one's words will be received. Um, and I think, I think there are a number of reasons for that. The number one reason is that we've seen this dramatic subjectification of everything. So it doesn't matter what you intend, what the meanings of your words um, are, um, are from, from your perspective as the author. Um, what, what matters now <clears throat> is, is the impact of those words. And if someone chooses, um, whether this is a, a legitimate um, response or not, whether whether this person actually feels this or not, whether this person chooses publicly to to take umbrage, to to, to be hurt, to be triggered, to be um, to, to be somehow uh, uh, damaged, um, is is entirely up to that person. And when you're speaking as a journalist to a large number of people, you, you are inevitably going to run into. Problems. You're going to run into people who 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 find something about what you've said or written, uh, you know, not just offensive or hurtful, but but then there's the you know this sort of you know as Jonathan Haidt talks about sort of the medicalization of of you you know um, offensive ideas, uh, and and so mm -hmm. you can now claim that you've actually been been damaged somehow. Mm -hmm. So you write for a lot of the top publications, publications that. Have I read or try to read, uh, and I know you can't, you might not be able to be too specific here, but do you, do, when you talk among fellow writers, some of whom might not even want to talk about these issues, do they share your concerns about the current ideological atmosphere or do they sort of, have they sort of, most of them signed up for it? I mean, I think that there's been a, a delineation, a fragmentation that's happened um, over the past mm, four or five years that 
that again would have been hard to anticipate a, a decade ago. Uh, I, I think what you're seeing more and more is journalists, writers, pundits, commentators who fall sharply on, on one side of this divide or the other. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's becoming unavoidable. Um, you, you know, you could for a while uh, straddle. Uh, when I started out in journalism two and a half decades ago, you know, one could have any number of opinions and then you would report and that had nothing to do with what you, what you thought about anything. Um, and, and then you might, um, you know, you, you might sort of dabble in, in sort of thinky pieces that, that would incorporate various vantage points or ideas or, or, or some theme that you're playing with. But, but it was always, um, it wasn't so, so partisan, it wasn't so, um, and it certainly wasn't so divisive. Um, and then I think, at least for me, I got into magazines and, and um, in the mid aughts. And um, so I graduated from newspapers to magazines and, and there was always a culture there. There was a, there was a, a, a liberal culture, but that culture was still pretty it, it elastic. It made room for, at least as far as I was concerned, it made room for, for you know, any number of voices, backgrounds, um, perspectives. Um, and at some point in the past, three to four years, uh, that, that, that elasticity began to uh, contract. And, and so at some point or another, you had to decide as a, as a journalist writer, um, are you going to try to stay inside these, these shrinking parameters um, and play this game, or are you going to step outside it? And if you step outside it, you, you, you have, you, you, you've kind of divorced yourself from that world. You can't really, um, you can't really swim back and forth anymore. Mm. Yeah. So what do you make of the fact that some of the top writers like Andrew Sullivan, Matthew Iglesias, um, have Glenn Greenwald have left these publications, some of which you probably written for, um, and ended up um, with very lucrative sub stacks and the like. Uh, is that is that a phenomenon that you think uh, is good for writers? Is it good for you? I think it's fantastic. I think the independent media space is is where all the in interesting conversations are happening. There, there's 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 very little that gets reported or talked about in in legacy media now that is that interesting or surprising. It might be very important. Uh, the New York Times will report on um, you know an infrastructure bill or uh, or or on you know a spending measure or on some negotiation on Capitol Hill or something going on overseas. Uh, and all those things are, are important, um, but, but it's all shot through now with, or, or I should say it's all constrained by a, a certain kind of um, um, kind of ideological framework that, that I, I think was much, much less felt um, really until the not so distant, you know, a few years ago. And so, so, so that means that it's just become boring. And the interesting conversations, the conversations that we want to have about, um, you know, what is happening to us as a society, what is going to happen to us, um, what we aspire to be, um, challenging orthodoxies, assumptions about race and culture and political realignments are kind of geopolitical structures, all these things that are very, very important that we, that we, we want to talk about. Uh, you can't really have like full throttled conversations the way I think you used to be able to have in, in kind of uh, legacy venues. Uh, but, but in the, in the independent space, <clears throat> that's where it's all, that's where it's happening. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Is there a point in the last few years when you just when you had to make a decision to sort of come out on on these issues? Yeah, it was last year. I mean, I think I think 2020. I think everyone would agree on on this point, um, irrespective of their politics. 2020 was the the great divining rod. Uh, you know, you could up until summer of 2020 still kind of play footsie with. Um, the identitarian left. You could you could kind of roll your eyes, but um, but I think also you know um, skirt some of the um, some of the the pitfalls or, or dangers. Uh, following George Floyd and and the sort of corporatization of wokeness, um, which you know 
you know, had about it a certain kind of ruthlessness and effectiveness that we hadn't seen until that point. Uh, you, you really couldn't, you, you, you couldn't, you couldn't do that anymore. You could, there was no, there was no skirting. And I, and I think it became in that respect, um, it became much more of a litmus test and it became much clearer. You, you, know, you really, you, you really had to, you were all in or, or not. And I think, in, especially if you were a, um, a white man, you, you know, you either sort of had to kind of like genuflect um, or, or you had to say, you know, I'm, I, I try to retain some semblance of, of independence and, and uh, open-mindedness and, and I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Hmm. So um, I had Jonathan Rausch on uh, this um, podcast right. a couple weeks ago, and um, he, he was recently in a very spirited conversation with his longtime friend, Andrew Sullivan, about some of these issues in the media. And Andrew sort of wanted to characterize the mainstream outlets like the New York Times as being sort of institutionally captured. And Roush pushed back and said, yes, of course, there are areas that they cover that are stilted ideologically, but, but the truth is the New York Times still does a lot of great reporting. We shouldn't lose sight of that. And these mainstream institutions still serve a very useful intermediating function in society. And, we, and while we should critique them when they cross the line on you know, ideology and they start filtering everything through this ideological lens, that's probably, I think he used the phrase, 10% of what they do is affected by that ideological lens and the rest of it is still just great New York Times reporting. Do you share Roush's view or let's say Andrew Sullivan's more pessimistic understanding of it? Yeah, I'm, I'm much closer to Sullivan on this. I think that, it, first of all, it's all the stories that we're not reading. Uh, so it's the lying by omission. Uh, the lab leak theory should have been reported on aggressively for the past year. We've only begun mm -hmm. to see, you know, aggressive reporting on it in the past, you know, month or two. Right. Uh, but Ra Ra Roush actually just wrote a piece in Persuasion, and I've heard him talk about it as well, saying that he actually thinks that's a success story, that that's an example of how the media eventually got it right. Sometimes you get it wrong, but the, the internal processes of of uh, what he would call the reality-based institutions ultimately allowed them to get it right. So I, I would counter that the, 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 the media is much, in my view, is, is a general matter, is much dumber than that. And I, I don't think that's what happened. I think that um, stretching all the way back to 2016, uh, there is this idea, um, thanks to the, the Trump campaign, that, that somehow Russia is bad and China is, if not good, it's not bad. Um, and to, 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 to touch Did you it, reverse those? Uh, China is bad, but Russia- well, is Russia, bad. from the vantage point of the progressive left. Uh, okay, got it. Got uh, it. Because Russia-, tr Russia right, I got it, okay. And China, and to, to attack China is somehow um, to, to, to be racist. Um, it's, to, um, it's to stoke Asian hate or, or something like that. Okay. Um, and so we get to the, 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 you know, we get to, we get to Russia gate, which turns out to have been grossly overblown um, and I, I'm sure there are many, many people in the Kremlin laughing a lot um, at that. Um, then we get to uh, then, we, then we get to the pandemic, and and I, I think that look, th there was there was I, I think a, a willingness on the part of of some very very astute science reporters to look at this more more thoughtfully, more holistically, but but there was clearly a lot of resistance uh, to to think about this. In, in you know to 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 push back against the you know communist you know the Chinese Communist Party line. I mean it, it's sort of laughable now, um, and and so yeah, I guess they got it right, but it shouldn't have taken this long, right? It shouldn't take a year to figure out that uh that that the that the CCP isn't honest. Um, you, you know, it's, it's like when we compare, you know, imprisonment rates in the United States and, and countries like Russia and China, and, 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 and we're, we're frequently told that if we have higher incarceration rates here than, than over there, and, and my response to that is always, well, we, which numbers are you trusting? Um, it's, it's the same principle here. Um, we, we should have been, the, the, these, these organizations should have been highly skeptical of anything coming out of China um, from the very beginning. Um, but I think that that pose, or I should, I should say, that I think that posture was was verboten. I think that um, I think that 
you know, looking at China <clears throat> in that more aggressive, through that more aggressive lens was, was just not, was, was almost sort of structurally um, out of bounds. Uh, and, and at a certain point, there's a, this a paradigm shift that happens, right? So enough evidence builds up and, and there's enough, you know, there are enough convoluting factors or contradictory factors that we get to the point where, where someone says, well, maybe there is something to this. And then maybe something else happens and maybe there really is something. And, and, and so then it builds and builds and builds. And then, and then of course the media um, heard like jumps on it. Um, and as if to make amends then goes about it. I think now there's almost a kind of going overboard quality to it where we're now like, they're all in on the loud leak theory. Um, okay. Um, I mean, there, there are lots of these big questions about, sort of like what is happening in the world. Um, I mentioned that story, but there's also the question of Trump. So Trump is, a, is, a, is I think in many ways, like the story you talk about like the media and, and whether I'm, I'm closer to Roush or Sullivan. And I think I'd be closer to Roush if after the 2016 election, legacy media had responded by saying, you know what? We totally got this wrong. We didn't see this coming at all. And that's because we don't really understand America. We, we understand New York, we understand Washington, um, and to some extent we understand Los Angeles and the Bay Area, but we don't understand, you know, anyone outside of these, 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 these bubbles. And, 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 and for a little while, you know, you would hear this talk, it was almost anthropological about how, like, I need to get out of my bubble and, and, and see America. A lot of hillbillyology going on. Exactly. But it was, it was so, it was so pretentious and, and self-important and it was, and, 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 and again, it was, it was anthropological. It, it had this kind of quality of like, look at these strange people. We need to study them and find out, you know, why they're so primitive. Uh, as opposed to, I'm going to try to understand how it is that we all live in the same country together and we have shared interests and overlapping interests, but we also have at times divergent, you know, concerns or, or aspirations. Um, and, and I think what you, what you found in a lot of legacy media was the response to Trump was not, it was not to look in the mirror. It was not, it was not to say, what did we get wrong? What's, what's going on with the conversation? But those people are obviously racist. So we don't have to listen to them. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if that's your response, if that's the way you're going to look at America, then, then you've kind of abdicated your, your, your responsibility. You, 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 you no longer... Are, are really, in my view, like a, a serious news reporting organization. Do you regard what's going on in the right and what's going on in the left similarly? Do you think that those are the same phenomena or similar phenomena on both sides of the ideological aisle? I mean, they're very different, um, you know, characterologically, and they're very different um, political and even spiritual forces, I think, coursing through both parties and, and the bases of both parties. But there are obvious similarities and, and trends and these sort of these illiberal tendencies. Uh, and, and there is this, this faith in, in, you know, both the illiberal right and the illiberal left in these sort of fantastical or, or, or you know, very um, you know, sort, of, sort of almost um, uh, uh, you know, invisible forces, right? So there's the, there's the QAnon faction, which um, progressives are very fond of, of <clears throat> needling, but, but you could just as I think easily, you know, question sort of the, the whole phenomenon of systemic racism and say, well, you know, the 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 idea of systemic racism, it's, the, the the idea or the accusation of systemic racism is is, you know, is is taken very very seriously now at, at all levels of American society, and it has permeated all of our major institutions, whether we're talking about the government, corporate America, Silicon Valley, Hollywood, uh, media at the campus, etc. Mm -hmm. But but no one actually. It can can prove that it exists. All they can point to right. are, are racial inequities, and, and and we can lament the inequities. We can say that's wrong. We want to fix that, but but we've we're not focusing on on that. We're we're assuming that the inequity is is itself the result of some what amounts to this conspiracy. And so so on the one hand, there's the one conspiracy camp, the the QAnon, Marjorie Taylor Greene people, who are I think rightly lampooned. Um, these are these are these are these are not good people, uh, and then there's the systemic racism people, and we call them, you know, sort of the establishment. Um, but but there's a lot of overlapping in the way that they they apprehend the universe. Mm, right. So I've been when <laughs> the, the issue of systemic racism constantly comes up, and um, one of the lines that I've been using, I'd like to get your 
your your take on it is, you know, I believe there's systemic racism in America, but I don't believe America is systemically racist. And by that, I mean that there are there are probably structures and systems that there is some kind of embedded bias. In some cases, I might be able to show that with some evidence. In some cases, I might not be able to show that. Um, and I might just suspect it. And, um, you know, I, I, I remember um, watching this um, documentary on Vice about um, a guy in Louisiana who was put in jail for 13 years for having three grams of marijuana. And they, they interviewed the sheriffs that put him behind the jail and how they had put him behind bars and how they had an incentive to put them in these, uh, these prisons that were now, so, so to relieve the state of their, of the, uh, um, of their burden. And, and they were going to get the sheriff's department themselves had growing budgets. And it, it did strike me as systemic racism, at least in that one example. Um, and, and yet the way that the term is used is to, to somehow implicate the entire United States as being systemically racist. Do you agree with that? There's a distinction to be made there between those two ideas? Well, I mean, certainly there are there are powerful echoes of the the not very distant past. Um, so we're all familiar with redlining. Um, we, we know that uh, that there's about to be this massive wealth transfer, um, you know, from the boomers to the next generation, and that's going to to deepen uh, racial inequity. Uh, uh, we, we know that there are uh, these 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 powerful vestiges of of Jim Crow and and of you know sort of e even the antebellum South that that continue to you know be a part of uh, the American ether, uh, if you will. But that's a very different thing uh, than saying um, the whole of America, every single organization, irrespective of <clears throat> how the the constituents of that organization think. Um, irrespective of their opinions or their viewpoints, um, the whole of America and every single organization that comprises uh, uh, that, that, you know, America uh, is 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 rotten. Which I think is is really where where, where we're being led, right? I mean, the 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 the, the message is, is not subtle, right? It is that the whole country is at its core. Uh, uh, cancerous. Uh, that, that's the, when we really argue about the 1619 project. What we're really talking about is um, <clears throat> is America just an evil extension of the very worst of the old world, or is it a break from that old world? So if if you believe that America was founded in 1776, what you're saying is uh, it's a break uh, that that uh, that it represents this this uh, titanic uh, paradigmatic shift. If you if you argue that that the beginning of America is 1619. Uh, then, then you're arguing that <clears throat> it, it's in fact uh, uh, the same old, uh, you know, um, you know, so-called white supremacy uh, that, that you know we hear so much about. I, I think that um, what that what that camp is really getting at, what they're really trying to argue for, is a, a wholesale reimagining of the country. Um, because if, if the country is truly evil. Um, systemically racist to its core, irrespective of how individuals think. And that's the critical point. It doesn't matter if we all have the right opinions now, or we all are, 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 are open-minded, or, or even if we're allies, whatever that means. Um, <clears throat> even if we're all good people now, if the country is systemically racist, that means that it has, we have no choice but to, to raise it, to, to remake it. Um, and so really what we're seeing, I think, is, is sort of we're laying sort of the intellectual you know, groundwork for, for something very radical that, uh, that the enabling class, the, the, the establishment, um, which is being co-opted by, um, by the, the true believers, um, it, it can't really appreciate. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, so the question is, what do we do about it? Huh. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, of course. I think, look, I think that we need to make it as easy as possible for the many, many, many people out there who know that this is insane and inane and wrong and that, that anti-racism is racism, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, to speak up. And, and I think that the, right now, 
for the most part, people are incentivized not to speak up. They're, they're incentivized to, to keep their heads down, to be good, to, to spout all the platitudes and talk about all the, the you know, to, to, to signal uh, you know, on social media how, how virtuous they are. Um, I think that we, we need to expand the conversation. This is why I think independent media is so important so that people feel like they're not alone. I think that, that uh, there are a lot of Americans, there are many Americans right now who feel very, very, uh, not just alienated, but atomized. They feel cut off from the body politic. Um, and, and, and I think that's reflected in their angers and in their, their furies really. They, they, they feel like they shouldn't be alone. And that's misinterpreted, I think, often to be racist or misogynistic. I, I think maybe there are elements of that, but I think frequently what's really at work is just this feeling, this deep, r- r- really sort of, um, you might say, immovable feeling of aloneness. Uh, and, and, and so a, a better discourse, one that is, is more thoughtful, um, at times more pugnacious, um, that, is, that is willing to ask questions and to explore uh, lines of thought that um, legacy media is, I think, just oblivious to um, or wouldn't touch. Um, I think all of that is critical because I think it, 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 it helps to um, push back against some of these, these forces and, and to begin to make it easier for people who have some authority to say, mm, that's enough. Hmm. So help people come out of the woodwork, really. Help them. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody, I mean, it's. I think it's worth adding that, you know, look, I, I spent the better part of the 2018, 2000, basically 2018, 2020, you know, 2020 covering like the, the presidential primaries uh, for Vanity Fair and, and for, you know, doing a few other pieces elsewhere. And, and I spent a lot of time with, you know, bundlers, fundraisers, um, people on the inside of sort of the, the democratic machine here in LA, um, which is, is, is one of the major ATMs um, uh, to which uh, Democrats uh, go when they're, when they're, you know, trying to get elected. And um, I don't know a single one of those people. And, and these are some very, I mean, it's easy to, to kind of like, sniff at, at bundlers and, and kind of refer to them as, as elites and out of touch and all that. And I think, I think that there's maybe some truth to that, but, but more to the point, I think a lot of them are very astute and very sophisticated and they, and they, they see what's going on. And there's not a single person I know or covered who, who thinks that, that the current climate is, is good, that it's somehow we are helped by this. Um, I think that they see that it poses grave dangers to the democratic party um, Democrats are going to get slammed uh, next year, and they're going to. I think they will. They're they're on track to, to losing the White House in 2024, um, and 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 I think they understand rightly that that would be terrible for America, uh, especially if the party cannot right its ship. So you're Jewish. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a Jewish podcast, so I thought I'd um, go into that a little bit. Where'd you grow up? Uh, here in Los Angeles. Um, tell me about your Jewishness. How has it played into your your writing? How has it played into your worldview? I think like a lot of people, a lot of, you know, kind of conservative or reformed Jews um, who grew up, grew up in the kind of late 20th century, early 21st century, um, enjoying a great deal of security and, and opportunity. Uh, you know, my, my Jewishness was always, my Judaism was always something which I, I was very attuned to, aware of, I thought about a lot, but um, I, I don't think I ever felt, um, I, 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 I don't think it was ever sort of like deeply, like kind of like, um, uh, how can I put this? It, it never, it, it didn't feel like it was a very, very big part of my everyday uh, life. Um, it was It was more, uh, compartmentalized. There was Shabbat, there was um, Hebrew school, my bar mitzvah, things like that. But I, I, I wasn't as conscious of it in a, in a very kind of like a, in a more 24 seven kind of way. And I think now for a variety of reasons, um, I have a family. So you, you think about it more than um, with regard to your children. Um, and then also this moment um, and, and, and then maybe compounding that um, we lost my, my father not long ago. And, and I think that, that, um, certainly makes one 
think a lot about sort of where you come from and and where you would like to be going toward. Uh, and so yeah, you wrote a great piece on your father and tablet about the great American Jew. I thought that was a very poignant piece. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think I think that in many ways, you know, the Jewish experience in America, as 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 is the case elsewhere, is a is a window into the health of the society. Um, and you know, I, I I I wrote another piece a few months before the tablet piece about my dad um, called the Mobius Strip of Hate, and and I think the point there is is something which I, I i think a lot about which is the sort of trifecta um that has emerged of sort of the anti-racism anti-semitism and then illiberalism and how they all fit together and and you know in, in my view and I, I i've seen this you know emerge it's, it's more um pronounced now than it was than it was just a year ago you know the the, the anti-semitism is really just sort of the um, the apotheosis, if you will, of the of the anti-racism. You know, Jews are are, are now criticized for being, um, you know, the whitest of white people, um, and and the illiberalism um, is 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 the necessary clamping down on dissent and and asking questions and saying things like, well, how can that be, or or what do you mean by that, or or can we define racism or anti-racism, or or or. Or, or you know what is happening to us uh, in these kind of bigger, more sprawling um, spiritual, philosophical questions that that y- y- we, you know, the discourse doesn't really make room for. Um, and so, I think that y- you know to, to to get back to your question about about my relationship with Judaism, um, maybe it, it's simply the case that like lots of people, um, as I'm you know like approaching or, or kind of deep into my late forties. Um, I, I'm, you know, more attuned to my beginnings. Um, I guess, you know, when you're in the middle of life, you begin to think more about where you come from and then where you're going to. Um, but I also think that it's, it's the time we're in. Mm. So there's a tension that I feel in this sort of uh, new enterprise in standing up for liberalism and opposing the imposition of critical social justice around this. I mean, I've been in the world of fighting anti-Semitism and racism most of my career. And in some ways, I feel like the the my defense of liberalism is in a way an argument that people are exaggerating racism. And in this country, you know, calling it a white supremacist country, talk, emphasizing systemic racism or the claim that systemic racism is ubiquitous. And, and I'm, I'm, and even though I certainly see that critical social justice ideology gives rise or fuels anti-Semitism, I'm worried that if I might exaggerate anti-Semitism as well, I might be doing exactly what I'm critiquing. Um, and and do you have do you have a thought about that? Is does that does that run through your mind as well? About about whether you might by by talk by emphasizing the anti-Semitism that might emerge from this ideology, we might be doing exactly what we're critiquing when we say that that racism is being exaggerated. Maybe we're exaggerating anti-Semitism as well. No, I, I don't. I don't see things that way. I think that uh, look the you know I. I take your point, and and there is like a, a sort of superficial parallel, but I I, I think that, you know, the, they're they're fundamentally the anti-racism versus the question versus anti-Semitism. They're they're fundamentally different different dispositions. Uh, anti-racism assumes that wherever there is racial inequity, and there is racial inequity everywhere, there is racism, um, and so that means there's racism everywhere. Um, it, the, the people talking about anti-Semitism aren't making universal claims like that. They're not making, um, they're, they're, not, they're not asserting that there is structural anti-Semitism. They're pointing out instances, very concrete instances, things that are easily identifiable um, that often involve words um, or violence uh, uh, and are, are palpably you know, anti-Semitic that, that, you know, that, 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 you know, I think, I think all reasonable people would agree that, that, that would, that would, you know, like, you, you know, like, you know, could, 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 you know, hold water in a court of law. Um, so I, I think, I think 
you know, yes, there's always a danger of, of exaggerating one's, um, you know, sort of claims of, of victimization. And I, and I, and it's true. Like I, I, I am, I'm very skeptical of, of like young Jewish people who I think younger Jews who, who have tried to appropriate some of the language of wokeness um, and who talk about needing allies and, and, um, and, and non-Jews doing the work and all this sort of, you know, silliness, this is kind of you know, idiocy really. Um, but, but, but I think they're just confused. I think that they're, they're trying to superimpose a language onto a separate experience. And it's, it's, it's really separate in, in, in the deepest, you know, most kind of like metaphysical sense of the word. So, so no, I, 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 I think, I, I, don't, I don't really see there being much of a, of a parallel when you, when you kind of burrow down beneath, a, you know, beyond a few millimeters. Right. So one of the reasons, one of the ways that um, the anti-racism camp sort of asserts its primacy is through what's sometimes called uh, standpoint epistemology. It, it claims that um, one's lived experience give, gives one moral authority to define racism for the rest of society. And, um, and it tries to crowd out any alternative perspective on it. Um, and yet, you know, it's, it's not unpopular in Jewish circles to say only Jews get to define anti-Semitism. Um, or, you know, Jews should be defining anti-Semitism for the rest of society. And some people, even on the Jewish right, Will will claim that the this current definition, the working definition on anti-Semitism, the IRA definition on anti-Semitism, um, that 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 should be taken at face value because it's based on Jewish lived experience. How how do you think about that? And I, and I'm saying this because I'm struggling with these with yeah. with the tension in that. I, I think I think I, I, again I don't think it's a Jewish lived experience. I think it's a you know, the reason, in fact, I think I think what what Jews are talking about when they talk about anti-Semitism is is let, let's be let's be clear about um, let's not try to paper over um, what is palpably um, anti-Semitic. Um, uh, let's not uh, lose sight of the distinction, or no, sorry, let's not pretend that there's there's a distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Um, let, let's let's acknowledge the the two millennia of of violent Jew hatred. Um, when, when talking about all these things. And, and let's also bear in mind that, that you know, in, in the immediate aftermath, in the, in, the, you know, in the three or four or five decades following the Holocaust, there's this kind of pause in overt anti-Semitism because um, it's, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, you know, sort of unfashionable. It's, 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 it's sort of uncouth to be you know, sort of openly, aggressively, you know, like anti-Semitic in polite circles. But, but of course, we're now moving beyond that, that moment. Um, so so the, the, the kind of the echoes of the Holocaust have receded and and now I think it's become you know again um, it's become you know more acceptable to be more open about one's Jew hatred um, whether that like has to do with like lived experience lived experience to me is an idiotic uh, expression there's an experience one has and and I think that it's true like we ought to take seriously people's experiences we ought to we ought to right. you know we, we, we want to take that into account when thinking about sort of um, how how opinions, um, statements, books, ideas affect people, but 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 really let, let's not kid ourselves. Like we're, we're, when when the anti-racists talk about lived experience, they're only talking about a certain species of lived experience. I, I I've met, known, worked with any number of Black and Latino Americans who. Um, whose lived experience, as it were, doesn't jibe with the lived experience that the anti-racists want us to be uh, talking about peddling constantly. Um, but if you talk about that lived experience, well, no one's going to, to cover that. No one's going to tweet about it. No one's going to, to march for it. Um, or, I mean, it, it's, it's now verboten in, in media to, in legacy media, to talk about the um, thousands of um, Black Americans who are getting killed by other Black Americans every year. Instead, it, it's, it's considered appropriate and right and righteous to talk about, you know, the, I think like roughly 20 um, unarmed um, black Americans will be killed by, by cops. Okay, um, I agree that nobody, um, irrespective of race, ought to be killed um, when they're unarmed by a cop. Um, I, I, I'm a thousand percent on board with that. I also think that if you really care about black lives, if you really care about saving lives, you focus on where the problem is, is the most serious. Uh, and so, 
So my point in, in all this is not to be circuitous, but it's to kind of point out that, that this term lived experience is, is a nonsensical term that is used to crowd out uh, lots of points of view and ideas and arguments that simply don't comport with the party line. Well, I, I really appreciate your perspective. I uh, love your writing. You. I'm glad you're uh, uh, more on the same team here trying to uh, preserve liberalism in American society, trying to fight against some of these liberal tendencies, including the anti-Semitism we're seeing. And um, looking forward to hearing more, reading more and being in close touch. Thank you so much, David.